Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mitch Goldstrom out of the Venice office. And um, I uh, am, you came out of the visual effects industry and film post-production uh, industry and, and have made a lot of contacts, maintained a lot of contacts, and uh, continue to hear some very interesting technologies that come up. And uh, one of those is something that uh, Tim here has been working on, 360-degree video. Um, Tim and I have worked together at Digital Domain, which is actually right across the street from us now and actually in the building we're sitting in. Um, but Tim's going to go into that uh, a little more later. So uh, I posted a Dory page. You'll see it on the uh, front page of the presentation when it comes up. But it's uh, go to slash 360 vid. It's go to slash 360 vid if anyone wants to post any questions. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to pop the presentation on the projector and introduce Tim. Tim Conway, everyone. Thank you, Mitch. I'm, I'm loaded here. How are you guys doing? Thank you for coming. So, uh, yeah, as Mitch said, I'm uh, here to kind of explain my side of 360 degree video. It's funny. Uh, I'll kind of read along. Okay. So, uh, yeah, first I want to say thank you for inviting me today. I'm aware that Google has a lot of history with 360 degree video, so forgive me if what I'm saying is old news to you guys. And honestly, I don't know if any of you guys actually get into it, but I know in other parts of Google it's a, a heavy, heavily used uh, piece of media. I am an independent 360 degree video creator, and I wanted to share my personal history with the process and explain how I came to shooting it. And recently I shot a 360 60 degree music video for a band called Matchbox 20, um, which is out now on their new album. And uh, this is how I did it. First off, about me, uh, as Mitch said, I've got 20 plus years in the visual effects industry. Um, I am the founder of a company called The Integration Company as well, which we specialize in three dimensional camera tracking um, as a service to feed uh, post houses, CG artists, things like that. Uh, you can see our website there, the integration, integrationcompany.com. Um, I'm not related to Tim Conway from the Carol Burnett Show. I get that quite a bit. Um, I'm not the voice of Mermaid Matt on SpongeBob, but I wish I were because that would be freaking cool. I have kids. Um, six plus years of 360 video production time, which means I really kind of bought my first lens and started playing with this about six and a half years ago. Um, but I really realized I have over 30 years of fascination with it. And I'll explain that in a minute. And fun fact, yes, I worked at Digital Domain in the 90s uh, in this exact building, probably in this spot I'm standing. We were, this was the model shop, I believe. Uh, we did Titanic and Armageddon and a lot of crazy fifth element, a lot of crazy uh, uh, chemical building of ships and models that happened here. Took a good few years off of everyone's lives. And uh, there is a good chance I slept in this building at one time or another in an office somewhere around here uh, due to what we call rendering in those days, which you know took days to do. So for me, what 360-degree video is, um, it's an evolution of, of movies, of 2D movies, and you know coming all the way back from the, the main things that happened with the first footage of the, the horse moving, which I found out actually was... Uh, derived from a bet that the California governor had made. I don't know if any of you guys ever heard that story, but he hired a photographer to help improve a bet that horses' hooves actually came completely off the ground when they were running, and it turned out to be the first uh, movie footage. Then you had, you know, Technicolor came along, and then 3D kind of came and went, and then VHSs and DVDs and Blu-rays, and now we're back to 3D. But it's all a, a push on the same thing. It's all taking a 2D image effectively shot from one direction and trying to enhance it and make it better and make people want to see it again and more and, and all that. Um, for me, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's not 360 video because 360 video is giving the user the ability to actually get in there and look around. And to me right now, there's sort of a an evolution and a, a revolution that's happened. So. Um, the revolution's on now. The evolution I'll talk about a bit here. But first, what is 360-degree video? It's 360-degree video, recorded video, 
that allow, and I may have some typos in here, forgive me, that allows the viewer to look in another direction other than the point of view that is directly playing back in front of them. Uh, here we see Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20 centered in the top window. The actual 360 footage shown below reveals that the entire band was there and captured all at once in the same shot. Um, I shot this footage, and we'll explain how in a moment, but first let's get back to the evolution. It's funny. The history, as I found it, is uh, starting with a thing called Circle Vision, which I first saw when I was a kid, about 10 years old, in Disneyland, in their Tomorrowland Circle Rama Theater. And I found that uh, Mr. Walt Disney actually patented the idea, and it looks like he had a Rambler station wagon, which it was one of my favorite cars, uh, and went in it and came up with this idea, or somebody came up with it, and in 1956, they applied for this patent on the technology. And previous, you know, or past years after, they built these crazy rigs that you see on the right here, and they built the big dome and shot all kinds of movies. And I remember standing in there, I think it was some flight over America or something that I saw when I was a little kid, and I couldn't believe that I could turn around and look backwards and see what was going on over there and look forward, and it was just mind-boggling to me. Um, they kind of disappeared for a while, and, and I got into this other world and grew up a bit and started making movies and all that kind of stuff and visual effects. And it all wasn't around for a bit, for me at least, until 20 years or so later, and I saw it resurface as something on the internet that every realtor was buzzing about called the virtual tour. And I started getting into it. I was going, man, that's like that, uh, you know, that old movie I saw back in Disneyland. How is this being done? How is it on my desktop now, you know? This is really, really amazing. And it turned out that there were mainly, and in my opinion still are, two main ways of, that I found to do it, and they're both very different. Um, this is an example of a, a system that I currently use up here on the table. I have some as well, and you guys are welcome to take a look at it. The lens on the left is a GoPano Plus uh, single lens. It retails for about $600, I think $600, and then there's some software that comes with it. It's another $200, I believe. So, you know, you're at a $900 investment approximately um, to get into building them, and you still don't have the camera. You have to get your capture source. And what the real estate people were doing were mounting them to nice high-end DSLRs, and they didn't care. They were shooting megapixel frames and all this stuff. But when uh, you can see here, when we got to put it on a video camera, at the time, like the graph that they have here, it's pretty good. It's a 720p HD camera. And because we're only exposing effectively a piece of the negative, only the center of it's useful. Only the vertical pixels are useful. The width is trash. I really want a square. You know, if I had a square camera, that's what I would be shooting with to capture with. But when you put it through the software, like this particular image, you put it through the software and it crops out the usable stuff and it unwraps it. And uh, the system is a very bit mirror, which created a distorted image, which I like to call the donut. Um, it's not the official term. There's all kinds of, you know, different terminologies for the ways to stitch and unwrap and make these things and, and you know, it's all, it all exists, but uh, for my purposes, I keep it simple. <laughs> so, yeah, go for it. So this is the uh, donut version of the system. It required software to unwrap and it required a downloadable app that you would, uh, you'd make your own footage and you'd download it and you'd pull it into this thing and you'd be able to play it on your own laptop and show it to your friends and go, oh, look how cool this is. And then uh, eventually they released a web player that you could embed into your own personal websites. And uh, then you're, you know, you're kind of onto something. You were going out and you were shooting your own 360 videos. But still, pixels were a problem. Um, I wasn't getting many of them. And it was not enough to keep it clean. So the second system that people were using a lot, uh, also used a distorted lens, but in this case it was commonly referred to as a fisheye lens, uh, which required a camera to shoot multiple pictures, usually turned around at the center of a lens and overlapping areas of the picture to allow it to be stitched together. And here you see a whole sequence of somebody out in the woods doing these tiles effectively with probably 20 degrees of overlapping image. 
then on the left you can see a still camera with a probably an eight millimeter fisheye lens on there and a, a nodal head which keeps it rotating right around the center of the lens axis. On the left they have their final uh, image. On the right there's effectively two spaces in this uh, system that don't get exposed. Straight down and straight down you're looking at uh, at the, the camera base, you know, um, and you need to clean that up. So they do a lot of paint out, which is fine because these were still frames. It wasn't really too much of a problem. Um, is the third Tim, system, is that why a lot of the, um, the quick time virtual reality tours had that disc? Like if you were to zoom down or up, they would have a disc with the quick time logo? Yeah. Because they couldn't expose that. Yeah, and piece. oddly enough, the, the donut system is effectively that too because it sees 360 degrees around but it only sees 50 degrees north and south of level. But that space is still there. The player just gets turned off and you don't go there. But you can give the viewer the ability to go there. You can open it up and you can put advertisement in there. You know, I've always thought about putting things about the bands that I'm shooting, maybe lyrics that are running in sync with the video and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's there. People tend to not like it, you know, they, they they say that there's something, you know, it's two schools of thought, but some people are more like, I, I don't get to look up. And like, well, I, I don't usually walk down the street and look straight up either. It's not something I commonly stare at my feet or at the sky about, but regardless, that's, that's me. Um, and during this time, and on into now, uh, and Google's actually very big into this too, uh, a third system emerged, which is a working which is worth mentioning because it's ridiculously cool. It uses normal lenses and takes large volumes of high resolution pictures that can be stitched together, commonly known as gigapixel imagery. There's different gigapixel.org and gigapixel companies and guys that build these motorized mounts that maybe you guys have seen it. It's really, really cool that it just takes little tiny pictures on really long lenses and pans around and uh, allows you to go deep into the 360, so you're looking at a wide shot, but you can zoom way in and see, you know, a dog that happened to be standing on a street corner that you would have never seen from the, the massive vista that you're looking at. I suggest checking that out if you want to burn a lot of time. Um, so these two styles of 360 degree image capture for stills soon got adapted to video. Uh, the donut style was pretty straightforward, I thought. You unscrew the bit mirror off of your still camera and you screw it onto your video camera. The manufacturer tweaks the software a bit and you're off to the races. But it also revealed a painful trait that I was not going to be easily overcome and that's what I was mentioning before that on the left, you know, you can see in that six years ago when I was doing this, it was 720p video. Um, then some HD proper 1080 cameras rolled out so I was able to get from my 304 pixel tall image to about a 550 pixel tall image. Um, you know, you can see on the left, I've cropped out, that's the only usable part of any exposed image when you're using one of these donut styled systems. So when it's unwrapped, it's 304 pixels tall, it's blurry. Dang it, I need more pixels. My inexpensive donut system just hit a brick wall. It's 2007, I hear true 1920 1080 cameras are happening and they come out and I'm trying them and it helps, but it's not better, not much better. And then people starting about talking about the red camera. And I'm a filmmaker, you know, I'm shooting all day long motion control cameras with 2K scans and and it's extremely expensive. You know, I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to put this thing on a Airy or a Panavision camera if I can even get my hands on one and then go process and scan and color correct and then all the stuff, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this out of my house with a video camera and a thousand dollar lens that I bought. So um, when I hear about this possibility of video at 4K, it's amazing. But the red camera and its 4K promise is my answer. With that, I show up at NAB with my friend, a uh, man you know named Andy Lesniak, and uh, I see it in person. It's not actually there. You know, they're, they're talking about it. They've got this big booth and this release, and they've got prototypes and boxes and images, and they say, we're taking orders. Anybody that wants to put down $1,000 can get on the list to buy the $10,000 or $20,000 camera when it finally gets made, if we decide to make it. 
Uh, it's not happening for my wallet to plunk down, but my friend Andy goes for it. So I'm still hitting that brick wall. Then out of seemingly nowhere, to me it happens, stitching. Video is alive and popping up all over the place. I go to a security expo in San Diego and see it for the first time. And there it is on the left. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with it. Uh, the immersive media system at the time, but it's, um, it's everywhere. It's strapped to bikes and cars and helicopters and surfers and all I can think to do is look like it's stitching is a monster. When Google gets involved and we get Street View, wow, this is great, I think. Except you need to have deep pockets to get in this arena. One cool thing I find is you can look around at more stuff. And they are more durable and less vulnerable than a donut system, because you can see those things are really uh, a piece of glass with a metal rod screwed through a piece of glass, <laughs> you know, holding this mirror out at the end of a camera, and it's, it's top heavy, and it doesn't like to move very well, and it vibrates when you start running around with it, and you know, it has its own inherent focus problems. So this thing looks really cool. All this uh, stitching stuff looks great, and all this new stuff's happening, but uh, it's a whole nother world. It's, you know, you got one camera up here on the left that's doing 11 different takes at the same time. So you have 11 streams of video that you're trying to process and color correct. And forgive me, I'm sure people who have done it here know it's painful. Um, other guys start following suit. More and more start coming out. Little ones come out. Somebody puts one in a Nerf ball for some reason. Uh, Google apparently has one with an ice cream man riding it around in a, a stadium. It's awesome. It's totally, totally amazing. Um, so they seem to run the video. Oh, the one thing I do realize, though, is what I'm doing with these cameras is I'm popping a tape in it, or I'm popping a hard drive in it, and I'm just picking it up and I'm going. I'm not dragging a leash. I don't have cables coming off to drives and, and different things. So, you know, I'm still in the pros and the cons, and I'm still in the... Um, in the less expensive world, which I can afford to do at this time. So over time, stitching cameras pop up, and they start getting smaller and cheaper. And I start to wonder, you know, is this the time? Uh, is stitching the time of the format wars? And all these things are happening. And I'm looking at donut and stitching, and who's going to win? Um, so in an affordable attempt for me, the independent 360 video creator I pick up a Canon 5D Mark II and take another try at the best possible image I can get with the donut lens. But it still falls short, even though it's a really nice still camera and it shoots really good video. Um, and it gets cleaner and it gets a little sharper and I'm getting better lenses, but I'm still stuck in the low pixel count world. Um, and then I get the call that brings hope. My friend Andy gets his Red One camera and he wants to shoot a 360 test. So we head to the roof of our office building which was right over here in Santa Monica at the time. And it's awesome. We're shooting red 4K HD, and I'm getting 38 by 40 by 2160 pixels. My unwrapped images are more than double what my HD footage was from before. But I don't own it, and over time I realize it's also a very expensive arena to try and get into. I rent a red Epic as well for a job or two, and it's going good, but I'm having some problems with uh, the focus and depth of field issues because I'm finding that the, the reds and their lenses and stuff are built like movie cameras. And they're, they think like movie cameras. So they have very similar depth of field uh, issues. They need a lot of light to hold something in focus. You know, I've, I've got a mirror, and I'm trying to bring somebody one foot away from this mirror and hold the infinity background in focus as well. So from a photography standpoint, it's a nightmare. You know, the best thing is a bright, sunny day and all the stops you can get. And, and all that, and it's still, um, it's still a little sketchy. Uh, then comes the beginning of what I consider now to be the revolution, and it's quite unexpected. I'm, I'm messing around with these bigger cameras and all this, and the guys that make my lens come along, and they make the GoPano iPhone 360 attachment. That's the one. And it's this tiny little lens, and they're showing it to me at the CES Expo. And it's all the buzz, and then you know CNN's talking about it, and everybody's like, "Yeah, there's this cool little 360 lens that you pop on your phone, and it, it puts it in the people's hands, and it's a 80 bucks, and you know away you go." And I'm 
effectively it's shooting HD. It's, a, it's shooting what I was getting off of the, the big 5D and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's going to have similar results, but it's in the people's hands. You know, a lot of people have iPhones. <laughs> You know, and anybody can go spend 80 bucks and you get the piece of software that the app downloads for free uh, that they made on iTunes. It's all running on Mac-based stuff, but, you know, won't fault them for that. Hopefully they'll, they'll cross out in some other genres soon. <coughs> but uh, so GoPanel releases a 360 lens attachment for the iPhone 4, which is okay. Still not 4K territory, but they add something else. And this is what was big for me. It's a user-friendly website for all the people that bought the lenses to upload their 360 home movies. And it gives guys like me a place to post higher quality videos as well. So you don't just post your little iPhone videos there. If I'm shooting big resolution videos, I can put them up there too. You know, As long as I'm, I'm using the software to transfer it over, I'm, I'm in this new sort of, you know, dare I say it, YouTube-styled world that's in 360, it's all in 360. Everything, every image in there, you can go in and look around. And there's guys like in Germany, I don't know who these guys are, but they're mounting them to the hood of McLarens and Ferraris and jamming down the Autobahn at like 200 miles an hour and getting tons of hits and you know, and it's rough and it's grainy, but it's just, they're, people are having fun with it and they're strapping it to snowboards and doing all kinds of stuff. And you know, that starts happening, which is really, really cool. Uh, and then the company, Gopano, that I've been, you know, doing work with and using their products, um, referred me to someone in Los Angeles who needs a 360 degree video shot. And it's around this time that JVC announces that they're releasing a 4K video camera that's more prosumer and it's going to be under $5,000. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm from $50,000 reds at 4K and now I'm looking at a $500 camera that's supposed, or a $5,000 camera that supposedly has the same pixel count. And uh, we make the arrangements for, for one to get sent out to me to shoot this music video. And you can see the configuration here on the left, um, the way it gets mounted. And the music video is for Matchbox 20. Uh, so the music video is for the song She's So Mean by Matchbox 20. It's done with, in a single take over the course of about five minutes. At two in the morning, while they are in the middle of shooting the official music video for the single to be released on YouTube. And the way this kind of happens is, you know, I'm there, I'm sort of the fly on the wall, it's don't get in the way, the film crew's everywhere, they're spending a ton of money, you know, but they have this set that's just perfect for it because the way that the, the video is constructed as well as the band is all standing in a circle in the middle of this room. And this girl comes in and just destroys, as you can see her over here, just destroys all of their stuff while they play in this circle. And I'm talking with the, the singer, Rob, and he's like, isn't this like the perfect opportunity to put 360 like right in the middle and we all just like sing right into the lens? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, holy grail, brother. You're talking to the right guy, let's do it. You know, can we make it happen? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll make it happen. So. Hours go by, you know, I'm there really sort of shooting this EPK kind of stuff. You can see on the, on the left end image up here, I'm getting behind them and walking around and interviewing people and, and you know, really building this sort of data to be used uh, more or less as filler and things that they're going to put into websites and maybe on DVD releases later and, you know, things of that nature. But lo and behold, you know, they sit down and Actually, we did it in two takes because the very first take, um, so this will be fun if you ever go watch it, the very first take, the drummer, Paul, uh, loses his drumstick in the middle of the song. And he just kind of like stops. And he's like, oh, oh so gonna wait, stop, 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 stop. You know, so th there's a conference and, you know, Paul, he has a very big part of the video later on, on where they are going to light him on fire. And they're putting stuff over the drum kit, and he's in a flame suit, and he's got to play the song like another 15 more times, and it's two in the morning already, and he's really not that into it. And they start asking me, going, "Well, can we use the part that we have? We got about a minute and a half of it." And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. I mean, we can use it. We can play it. It'll be a minute and a half of your song that you can post somewhere or whatever." Um, I go, "You know what? But to be honest, 
it doesn't really matter. If you drop a drumstick, drop the drumstick. You know, if you knock something over, knock it over. There's crew all over the place walking around in the background setting up the next shot. I'm in here. There's me on the left in the green shirt, far back corner. You know, it's I'm just like, go for it, you know? And it kind of re-sparks them, and they're like, okay, they, they do one take. All the way through, he drops the drumstick again. He gets this look on his face, and Rob just keeps singing and walks around and goes over and picks it up and comes over and hands it back to him and walks back over the microphone and keeps going, and everybody's happy. And you'll never see it if you don't turn around and watch that moment when you're watching the video. But that's the point of the 360 video. Would now be a good time to watch the video? We could watch the video. See what I did? I showed you something else that it does. Well, she gets what she wants all the time. Cause she's fine. So, uh, for an angel, she's a hot, hot things a little slower when it's so blind. big and wireless. So I found when it got posted, you know, people were commenting on it. I posted it up to GoPano. And, uh... Fortunately, the, it was timed with the, the record label, and they did some press, and uh, we did some press about JBC using their camera, and you know, here I am finding that, oh, it's good to watch these guys, you have the ability to sort of, you know, and look at other things. And so I'm probably running around, there's our film crew back there, oh, there's me. Holding my 5D. And what's kind of interesting about this stuff as well is it, it makes a um, it makes this video, but it also makes this video, which can be used in a uh, just a regular post it on any old website, YouTube, whatever, blackboard or around it, not. Um, I posted one on Vimeo that just kept this aspect ratio, like a crazy 3.4 to 1 or whatever it comes out to. Uh, I did one where I just added a slow pan the whole time. So over the course of the song, they just drift across the frame and drift across the frame. So, you know, there's a lot of different uh, possibilities and things you can do in post. Other than that, I really did hardly anything to it. There's a little bit of color correction, which was done in Final Cut Pro. So for me, I go off and I shoot this thing. Technically, it takes the length of the song to shoot. I go home, I pull the JVC footage in. It gets processed through some JVC software and spits out this 3840 by 2160 uh, pixel count image. It takes maybe 15 minutes. Uh, I pull into Final Cut Pro, I do some color correction had some like a head title and some credits and the things rendered and done and ready to post in about three hours. So you can see it's not really a, a big time consuming process. Um, the iPhone ones are even quicker. I think you can actually upload it from your phone to the, to the site, you know, right then and there, which is kind of cool. There goes the drumstick. Rob comes over, helps him out. Back on the mic like a true professional, nothing ever happened. Then he goes over and messes with him some more. And that's what I found people started watching and commenting and going, oh yeah, the guy drops a drumstick at so and so, and you know, you gotta go check this out. And, you know, so you can imagine there's, there's a lot you could do because there's a lot of discoveries that uh, get made. The fun thing too is when you put this in your iPad or iPhone app, um, it'll use the gyroscope and you can do 
do it that way as well and pan around and look around and all that good stuff. So I'm, I'm on the donut. You know, I'm like, great, donuts here, pixels are there, money's cheap, you know, I don't have to do all this crazy stuff and, and I, can, I can be a player, I'm back in the game. And uh, just when I think that the donut style has taken the lead, for me, the independent 360 video creator, I learned that there's a new stitching system making its way out into the world and it's got the potential to change the game again. People are now putting very powerful GoPro cameras into action in these systems. And this is happening now. Just got an email a month ago from this company. And then a guy who I've been working with who's a code writer in Tokyo uh, completely randomly sends me a picture of a rig he's built. And it's six of these things strapped together. And, you know, and he's writing a player for it. And, um, you know, everybody's starting to do it. And the thing is, especially what you can see here with the, the new GoPro Hero 3 Black, it's capable of shooting 4K at 15 FPS um, in burst mode. So I'm not going to be getting a lot of time out of it at that pixel count, but it means that there's hope that they're going to get better and they're going to have longer time and bigger cards. And, you know, the Hero 4, the Hero 5 could be the one that shoots for 45 minutes at 4K or whatever when they, they get there. And it's 400 bucks. So... You take, you know, you need six of these, you still haven't spent much money, and you get a mount, and there's companies that are in the process right now, if they're not already out giving it away or selling it, um, producing the players that you'll need to embed your websites, producing the stitching software. You know, the stitching thing has always been sort of an evil beast. You know, it's like when the guy crosses from this camera to that camera, you piece of a hand gets cut off or something goes missing and the software really has to spend a lot of time. You know, I just know from my visual effects stuff and stitching HDR images and stuff like that, that uh, it's, it's got its own pack of problems. Um, and it also has limitations that you can't get too close to the camera. Because if you get into this, you know, nine inches from this one, these cameras can't see you anymore and they don't have those pieces to stitch back on. So there's a certain range as well of of operational space, but it's cool, it's waterproof, it's cheap, <laughs> you know. Uh, we break them all the time. I visual effects supervise commercials as well. I did a Nike thing a couple months back where we were bolting the cameras to cleats of actual football players' shoes, and they were running down the field and just absolutely destroying the cameras, you know, in, in two, three takes, and they were going, send the PAs to Best Buy, we need six more, you know, and the Trucks were showing up, and they just keep shooting. So, you know, it's it's coming into the the public domain much more, and and people are making iPhone apps, and I saw a place that's got a Droid app now, which is great. Um, and you know, where is it going? What's the the revolution going to become? In my mind, there's a couple of places. Um, I think it will be, it will always be the multiple styles. You know, there's going to be the donuts, and there's going to be the stitching. Um, it's a matter of cost, quality, and the right tool for the job, et cetera. The other questions for the future of the medium, how will it be used? Um, I think smart TV is a logical choice to support multiple streams for 360 video. I have one. You know, there's apps on it. There's, it's doing 3D right now. You know, I've got glasses, and I can watch cheesy flyovers that people have made. And, you know, the content isn't really getting there yet that's uh, streamable, but you know, neither is the 360 content so much because it's, it's fairly new, you know. Um, it's gonna take people like me and people like Google and people like these other companies that are out there, uh, production companies that are producing it and directors that are getting their heads around it um, and people to see it as what it is, you know. You can always watch it from one POV and just call it a video all day long. You don't ever have to turn the camera around, but you have the option with this stuff. So I think, uh, you know, NFL, ESPN, some of those guys are, are, are looking at it and, and it's a great place for it to be, you know, in sports. Um, there's a system that GoPano is developing and maybe others as well that just uses uh, a camera and a fisheye lens. So it's only 180 degrees, but they have a, a software that allows you to look at the whole vista or actually zoom in and, and move around inside of the stream and sort of navigate yourself. 
And then you got things like, you know, head tracking software, which would make it really cool to be able to just use your own head to look around and forget about controlling it. You just look this way and it goes that way. Um, the U2360 video, I just had to put that in there because I was like, for me, I, I, when I heard that U2 was doing this 360 tour and 360, 360, I was blown away when I found out there was no actual 360, but they built a really cool round arena. Um, you know, and then Swiffer came out with a 360 broom and everybody else had a 360 thing. So, you know, it really kind of just became a buzzword. Uh, it's the new 3D. It's the new 3D, you know. Um, so there you go. Uh, it would be nice to be able to post a few 360 videos on YouTube. So I can, you know, wink at somebody that's in the camera somewhere or something. But, but I would assume that uh, the, so the Go Panel player is specifically designed to scroll left and right and up and down. Uh, the website, the, the web. one that you upload to, right? It's it is because they know that their lenses are donut style lenses, and they're only shooting that style of video. But the only thing specific about the file is the resolution. Correct. It, so if it, you need to either be using their app, right? The, you know, there's some sort of little bit of code that gets tacked on the end that says this is a, a GoPano product or or something. Um, either it's coming through their app or it's coming through the editorial software, which I have that I got with the Big Lens. Um, and that's another thing. They do have a piece of software that's similar to like an iMovie style thing where you can load multiple 360 clips and then bring it down to a timeline and trim them. Mm -hmm. You can add an audio track and things like that. It's, it's pretty basic, but... But it um, sounds like it's all proprietary. Uh, right now there's no like standard for 360 video file format or or metadata or anything like that? Not necessarily, no. Um, okay. You know, people are just doing it as best they can. You know, mm -hmm. people are coming out with different ways of doing it. Um, you know, I've listed here that uh, these companies on the right, uh, production companies, Virtual Surfers, Immerse Media, Mativision is an interesting one. Um, what they're doing, they seem to have come up with a formula for music videos only. Mm -hmm. And they're using the little um, cameras that you saw in the earlier pictures, uh, the ladybugs, I think they're called. So it's five little video cameras. But they're putting like 10 of them in, a, in an arena. They've just done Muse's uh, concert, and they did... If you go to their website, check it out. But what, they're, what they appear to be doing is only doing music videos or only doing live concerts that then you can go to iTunes and buy the concert. You can download it to your phone in 360. <clears throat> watch it in 360, jump around to the multiple cameras so you're watching again. You know, the next time you watch it, you're going to hang out by the drummer for the whole show, you know, or whatever. And and I think that that's always been one of my dreams of a, a good use for it, you know. Virtual groupie. Virtual groupie, man. <laughs> and especially if you were at the show and you get to voyeuristically watch yourself, you know, 10 years later and remember what happened and see it from behind the stage and over here and over there. So... So right, there you go. Uh, Thank you to Mitch and Google and GoPano and 360 Heroes, Ryuben, my friend in, in Tokyo, Tracy Shelby, Alex, Allison, all the people that helped me with this and 360, my family, and everyone that's out there pushing 360 video right now. Let's Appreciate open it up it. to uh, questions if anyone has them. I will be taking this presentation, making a copy of it, and making it available for anyone who wants it. Here you go. So I was wondering, you were talking a little bit about the playback in the homes, and with the price of HDTVs coming down, do you think people will start putting multiple screens around their family room for watching 360? So you'd be able to look at one screen and then look at the other POV in another screen? Yeah, something like the that original Disney this thing. Disney Circle Vision, yeah. Um, I think so. It's not a bad way to do it. It's, it's actually, I've seen kind of that it is happening. Um, more over in like Sweden and Amsterdam and they're, they're really pushing this stuff a little bit faster and there's like these sort of uh, little mini domes that they're building now that are maybe like, you know, 20 feet across or 30 feet across and inside it's a screen and it's got a projector in it. Um, so yeah, I would think somebody that's into it could definitely build their own little mini in-home system. Thanks for the presentation. That was yeah. really fun. No um, my question is less a technical question, more an artistic one. Uh, I re remember 
Circle Vision as well from, from Disneyland, from Tomorrowland. And one of the things I, I saw that they s were discovering was kind of how to control the, the point of interest. I mean, there would be mm -hmm. something big happening over here, but then something else would happen, and they would use music, and yes. the whole audience kind of knew how where they could yes. find stuff, and someone would discover it, and then we'd all turn. In, and I think your drumstick point is uh, a little bit of that. It's like suddenly we... There's something over there. Something happens, at, and you yeah. know to look. Have you any more um, lessons, I guess, from your experience in this for how that works? Uh, yeah, there's two things that you can do, actually. Um, right now, with the way this, this system works, uh, there's another sort of a track called a tween track. And in the software package, you can make an edit that if you know, you know, I want to watch the drummer for a while, and then I want to go back to him, and then I want to come over here, and it actually plays back your edit. So the whole time you're watching it like a normal music video, but you still have the option to get in there and click and, and drag around. When you let go, and it comes to the next point where that tick mark is, it just pops back into the video as the edited video and keeps going. And that's one way that's sort of focusing Control. people on what, what you want them to see. Um, but sound is actually another one as well that is being talked about right now. And I've been approached about a project that I can't talk about really, but it is one of the things about it. It's a music thing, and there will be higher heightened music in certain areas that should draw the user to that spot. You know, um, you're going, what's over there? Obviously, you need to be listening in some sort of a surround sound kind of way. Right. But uh, they are starting to bring that into the fold as well. Um, so are these players evolving with surround sound? So the, the, the sounds have a geographic position as the, the, um, the, the direction changes? I'm not sure. I haven't gotten that far into it yet. It's just been presented to me recently that um, they want to do it. Um, and I'm sure other people in other places yeah. have done it. Why wouldn't you do it? Sure, I'm, especially for video games. Yeah, and it's so totally on. doable. Yeah. Um, it's definitely coming, and I think that from what I've seen, you know, what I've noticed up to this time, the the, the big projects that have happened, you know, like a, a music video concert thing that they spend a lot of money on, they kind of really seem to be these one-off things that happen every year or so. You spend a bunch of money on it. it, it goes up onto a big site and runs. It's all sponsored by a Doritos or a Ford or somebody. And then it just kind of goes away. You know, it runs its course, and they take it off. Or you know, I don't know why it goes away, but they they shut them down and turn them off. Um, the thing I would like to see happening more, and especially I, you know, with like the GoPano thing, is why why shut it down anymore? You know, why not just keep building these worlds and these databases of 360 video and and having it available? You know, a lot like Google is doing with the Street View stuff and, and that, you know, um, I think it's just now getting to the point where more people are going to have access to it and we'll start creating more cool stuff because of it, you know. Anybody else? Ah. Yeah, there you go. It does. Uh, it's probably done with an iPhone. That might be. Yeah. Are you on GoPano still? Yeah, I just searched for Venice Beach so I can find the one that uh, um, that you had done walking around Venice Beach for the drum circle. Oh yeah. Here was uh, what you could do here. My company, that's sort of the production in entity, Tick Three Hundred and Sixty. If you do a little search in the window up there, all of the videos I've been involved with will. Here. This is your Venice Drum Circle. I have the volume turned all the way down. This I shot time lapse. And I'm carrying it, obviously, so that becomes the other sort of um, notable thing about shooting a 360 is you're pretty much always in your own shot, unless you're under it. Or above it, and it's not too easy to get above it. I think a hat rig is in order. <laughs> what? A hat rig? Yes. A helmet. Let's see what 
sense. Yeah? There are uh, no questions on the dory, uh, and there's no more questions uh, in the room. So uh, thank you very much, Tim, for, for coming and giving this talk. You're welcome. Uh, if anyone wants to come up and uh, put your fingerprints on the lenses, the expensive <laughs> lenses that Tim has brought with us. JVC yeah. here you can uh, dabble with. Also, this one's kind of interesting. Just to show you that people, companies with money do have interest. Sony, for their bloggy, released the 360 lens attachment. So this little guy actually is a donut system as well um, in a very tiny format. Unfortunately, it's shooting like 720p and not 1920-1080, but it was another impulse buy I had to have. <laughs> It's, the question uh, was, if, uh, does Sony have a site you can log into? They had a way of allowing you to convert it to be able to post it uh, into your sites. Um, I think they do maybe have a site as well, but it never seemed to take off like the GoPano one did. You know, I think this was a different thing. Than, once it got attached to an iPhone, it just got into so many more people's hands. You know? But... Uh, yeah, I'd, I would have to look back into it and see if they still have a functional site or not. I'm not sure. I kind of, kind of blew right by it. You know, there are companies, just standalone guys, that are. You know, I don't know if you have my demo. You know, if it gets up there with the websites that are listed on the back, um, okay. which you're more than welcome to have. But um, you can look in some of those. Uh, the guy in Tokyo, Ryuben, gives away the players. He, doesn't, you know, it's just a thing he does. Um, I supplied him with his first actual red shot donut video, and he went and built me a player just because I gave him the footage and posted it for free for everybody. So it's out there. You can make your own sites and embed it in if you're not um, using GoPano's site, obviously, because um, you do have to make an investment in one of their products in order to be able to get your videos into their site. So that's why, you know, I would love to see a YouTuber or somebody be able to open up uh, an area. So if, if anyone out there is from YouTube uh, engineering yeah, and wants yeah, to reach might, out to... You might know those guys. Uh, uh, to, but, uh, Tim, definitely let me know and, or I'll put you in touch with them. Yeah, please do. All right. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks cool. again, everybody. Thank you.